that uh, very little need for physical activity. We can uh, uh, drive anywhere we want practically. You fly. You, you don't. You don't walk much. It's just not. You don't do physical labor much in in your job. So you don't expend much energy, and it's so easy to overload on calories. You know, you can get a thousand, two two thousand. You can get a two thousand calorie appetizer at a place like Applebee's, some of these uh, uh, restaurant chains. Um, so cheap, t tasty junk food, no exercise, that equals obesity. Those are two uh, identifiable factors. The television watching keeps kids cemented in their, in their couch, the couch potatoes, couch french fries that we have these days. But there may be a lot of other factors, such as overweight women giving birth to overweight kids, kind of having this multi-generational effect that is seen in animal studies. Um, and uh, environmental pollutants, uh, um, BPA, bisphenol A, which is in the lining of cans and is in all of our bodies, uh, dioxins, who knows what other contaminants might promote obesity. And for BPA, there is evidence in animals that uh, that contributes to overweight in animals. So, you know, there are thousands of these unknown factors that may, be, may affect us uh, in you, <coughs> um, uh, before we're born. And that all the lectures by physicians when, when you're 10, 20, 30 years old may not have much of an effect because we're destined by these uh, invisible uh, um, um, tr um, factors that promote obesity. That's going to, you know, those are little... Um, you know, a little bit far out. There's some evidence, no proof. We need a lot more scientific evidence <coughs> about the factors that promote obesity before we're born and after we're born. Uh, yes. Appreciate it coming out. And I wanted to ask a question. You characterized very well the uh, consumption and health side of things, but it seems like a major uh, factor uh, is the production side, and we have a, a agricultural system that's heavily subsidized to produce the kinds of foods that you're you're describing. Uh, so I'm wondering <laughs> if you could comment on any uh, signs of movement towards integrating uh, food and farm policy, because uh, uh -huh. I think the kinds of farms that would be producing the foods you're talking about would look like a very different and probably much more healthy agricultural system than we have today. Yeah, um, there are a lot of changes that need to be made in the agricultural system. Kind of on the nice end, you know, that's maybe easy, maybe easier to deal with, would be for the Department of Agriculture to provi provide more support to small farmers uh, and farmers and fruit and vegetable growers who do not want a direct federal handout. <coughs> they see what's happened in the grain, grains industry, which is monopolized by large farmers and cotton in, in particular, wheat, corn, um, and the small guys being driven out. Fruit and vegetable growers love indirect subsidies, though. In particular, um, Senator Harkin has had a small program that's expanding now, providing free fruits and vegetables in schools, in low-income neighborhoods, one serving a day. In pilots, it's, it was wildly popular, <coughs> and um, popular among kids. And the fruit and vegetable growers know that there's only one place that schools are going to get the fruits and vegetables from them. So that's the kind of a subsidy that they like. Um, and I think we're going to see that more and more. In terms of the subsidies to big farmers, to the grain farmers, and the cattle industry doesn't get direct subsidies. But since cattle and, and chickens and pigs eat uh, corn, soybeans, and, and other uh, uh, large and small grains, um, there could be an effect, a benefit to the cattle industry. But the subsidies have changed a great deal in the last uh, 10 years or so. Um, economists who've looked at this, can, and, and I remember the studies in particular for um, on corn, where you know, the, why, it, it has to do with soda pop. Soda pop is sweetened with high fructose corn syrup. And so some people say, soda pop is so cheap. And it is, it's dirt cheap. I saw at Walmart. Um, a two-liter bottle of their house brand of soda for 78 cents for two liters. You know, it's unbelievable. Uh, 
So some people say it's so cheap because corn is subsidized and, and that leads to cheap high fructose corn syrup and it, leads, and it goes to cheap soda. But when they look at the effect of corn subsidies, there's virtually no effect on the price of, of corn or high fructose corn syrup or soft drinks. So it's a changing the subsidies sounds like um, a solution, but it really wouldn't have much effect. Um, um, there are other kinds of subsidies to the cattle industry and, and, and uh, chickens and pigs, and that's loose environmental controls. You know, huge cattle feedlots, these are cities, basically. You know, the pollution of a, of a Cleveland on one, one feedlot. Um, and some of that gets into the rivers and streams. Air pollution from the smell. Um, uh, and that's something the government could do something about. It could set limits on the sizes of feedlots or on the length, um, number of, of um, months cattle could be in feedlots to cut down on a lot of that pollution and possibly end up with leaner beef as a bonus to consumers. And same thing with you know these chicken houses that have 50,000 chickens in one large house. Then they have huge piles of manure some, and that gets into uh, rivers and streams and the Chesapeake Bay and, and other areas. Those are things that I'm sure the Environmental Protection Agency is going to be looking at. So to put some and, and from the environmental side and then from the um, humane treatment of animal side, I think we're going to see changes. A lot of pressure to give animals more space. You know, right now six chickens are, six layer hens are crammed into a little cage. They can't even turn around. Veal calves can't even turn around. Uh, pigs can't turn around for much of their lives. Uh, and so I think California passed a law, Florida has laws and so on, that I think will bring some changes that will have environmental effects. Um, none clear what, if there'll be any nutritional benefit, and, and certainly animal welfare. Thank you. Today at the City Club, we have been listening to a Friday Forum featuring Michael Jacobson, Executive Director of the Center for Science in the Public Interest. Thank you, Dr. Jacobson. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. This forum is now adjourned. For information on upcoming speakers or for podcasts of the City Club, go to cityclub.org.